Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Newcomers to the world of keeping and breeding boas are faced with a huge amount of diversity of different types of boas to work with. Sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming. Within all these different snakes, we have two main categories, the morph boas and the locality boas. And of course, there are pros and cons of working with each of these broad uh, classifications of boa. So today I'm going to go over some of the pros and cons of working with morph boas. In a future episode, I'm going to do the same kind of analysis for locality boas. And hopefully this might be helpful for newbies who want to decide what boas to work with. If you like this video, please subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel for more videos on all aspects of keeping and breeding boa constrictors in captivity. As most of you guys know, there's been a major shift in reptile breeding over the last three or four decades. And this shift has been that more and more people are working either solely or primarily with morph animals. And by morph, I mean animals that contain mutations that give them a different phenotype or different physical appearance. This is usually in the color of the animal or the pattern of the animal. In some cases, it can also be in the scalation, such as the scaleless uh, forms of different rat snakes and ball pythons that are out there. Um, in fact, a lot of or several species of the primary species that people work with, like the ball python, there's not even anything other than morph ball pythons, other than your normal or wild type. There's no locality specific ball pythons, at least that I'm aware of. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. With boas, we're fortunate to still have the locality specific boas. Uh, and people are still working with boas as they appear in the wild. That being said, there's certainly some good stuff about morphs. And as you know, I'm primarily a locality breeder. I'd say I'm about 90% locality uh, and about 10% morph boas in my collection. And when I posted some pictures of some of my morph boas not so long ago online, I got a lot of surprise reactions. You know, they were almost thought that I was going to the dark side or, you know, why are you breeding these morphs? Um, and it was, it was a little surprising because, you know, I, a lot of people think of it as two camps. We have the morph breeders and we have the locality breeders and there's this rivalry or, you know, some kind of a um, disagreement between the, the basic philosophy of each approach. But I think that morph boas do offer a lot. Um, that complements the locality boas quite well. And I'm going to talk about those in the next, those uh, things in the next few minutes. So the first advantage of morph boas over locality boas is that in general, they're better suited to living in captivity. And that is not surprising because these guys are practically domesticated at this point. Some of these morphs have been in captivity for probably eight or 10 generations now. And so they've been selected either consciously or unconsciously for characteristics that enable them to survive better in captivity. Um, one of these characteristics is faster growth. So um, when I first got morph boas, I was amazed by how fast they grew. This is a 2017 uh, jungle marin boa. Um, by comparison, my locality specific boas from 2017 which had been fed on the same feeding schedule are about a foot or so shorter than this particular animal. So they grow a little faster. I would say most morph boas put on about a foot and a half per year, uh, which is quite a bit more than my locality boas. And that's remember given the same feeding schedule. I feed my animals uh, every other week for the first two to three years and then every three weeks until they're about five years old and then I go to about once a month. So they're able to grow faster given the same feeding schedule. Um, in general, they're also more like a pet animal. So um, if you want an animal that's going to be calm to handle and not try to escape and just seems to be a little more well adjusted to living in captivity, a morph boa is going to be a better choice. They're just a little more laid back. If you want an animal, you can take out and handle. In general, I've found that um, a lot of the issues, the husbandry specific issues that affect locality boas do not affect morph boas. For example, I've never had any shedding issues with my morph boas. 
You know, I keep the humidity about 60 to 80 percent, but often I'll get some shedding issues, especially in the true red tail boas. With the morphs, I'd never, I've never seen that. And then I've never seen any kind of regurgitation issues like you see with some of the baby true red tails. In addition, I've never had any issues getting these animals to eat frozen thawed. So again, these at this point are really domesticated animals and they've been in captivity so long that their behavioral characteristics have changed fundamentally in favor of them living in captivity. The second advantage to working with morph boas is that they can be very beautiful in their own, own unique ways. So the goal of many morph breeders is to combine multiple genes into the same animal to create these living works of art that are also known as designer boas. This particular animal is known as a VPIT positive junglo or VPIT positive jungle sunglow. And this is a three gene animal. It contains the VPIT positive albino gene, the hypomelanistic gene, and the jungle gene. I know that everyone has their own preferences with regard to the looks of a boa constrictor and of course beauties in the eye of the beholder. But if you like this particular type of aesthetic, then the morph boas might be for you. Um, they can be also very a lot of fun to work with. And as I mentioned, breeding these animals definitely offers a nice balance to some of the things that you get from breeding locality specific boas. Another advantage of breeding morph boas is it's really a great way to learn genetics. And so when we're talking about the genes in boas, there's really two main types. We have the dominant recessive genes like the albino and the anerythristic. We also have the incomplete dominant genes like the hypo and the jungle gene. And this particular animal is a hypo jungle IMG with a 66% chance of being hat for the VPIT positive albino. No, quite a lot to remember actually but um, so this animal has three different incomplete dominant genes and it might be carrying a fourth recessive gene in the heterozygous state of course i need to do a test cross in order to tell if it's carrying this particular gene so i remember taking genetics in college and we would do like a two gene cross with you know mendel his famous uh, p experiment and we'd use our Punnett squares to predict the outcomes of a cross. But with boa breeding, it gets even more complex. And there's actually quite a few different algorithms online that you can go to to predict the potential outcomes of any given cross, such as at uh, morphmarket.com. But I think it's just really cool to see the science in action. You can see you know, the theoretical science of Mendelian genetics translating into actual numbers in your boa constrictor offspring. Um, so I really look forward to when this animal is old enough to breed and I can look at the different phenotypes of the babies and I can see how they stack up to the hypothetical uh, Mendelian ratios that would be predicted. So again, gen learning genetics is one of the advantages of breeding morph boas. The last advantage of breeding morph boas that I'm going to talk about is that you can make a lot of money breeding morph boas. And I say you can make a lot of money because it doesn't mean you will make a lot of money. And I would reckon that for everybody that makes money breeding boas, probably 10 people are going to lose money breeding boas. Some of them are going to lose tens of thousands of dollars. So I know that making money with boas is a very controversial topic. In fact, I probably will cover this in a future episode of this show, but I'll just say that um, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with making money breeding boas, as long as the welfare of the boas is the number one priority and you don't make any compromises regarding the welfare of the boas. So that being said, this takes us to the disadvantages of working with morphs. And the num first disadvantage I'm going to talk about is that a lot of people are getting into it to try to make money. It's not uncommon for someone who gets into breeding boas specifically to make money to prioritize 
financial considerations over the welfare of the animals. In addition, boa morphs are basically a pyramid scheme. And it works like this. The first person that is able to breed a new morph can often sell the babies for in excess of $10,000 a piece. And so there's a very high demand and a very low supply. And then so the next generation of breeders who produce more animals a few years later can often only get about half of that for what they uh, sell their babies for. So it goes down to about $5,000 a piece. And then the next generation might go as low as two to $3,000 a piece a few years later and so on. And so we see the value of many of the morphs going from thousands of dollars to just a few hundred dollars within you know 10 or 20 years or so. So this is a VPI T positive albino which is one of my all-time favorite morphs. And these animals were selling for many thousands of dollars. Um, they came to the $1,000 range probably about, I don't know, five or 10 years ago. Um, I think I paid $600 for this guy about two years ago. And right now, it looks like the market for these animals is somewhere in the four to $600 range. Um, so they're holding their value relatively well. I mean, it's a very beautiful animal to look at. But many of the other morphs that have become more and more common, like the hypo and the jungle, are only selling for a small premium over the normal wild type animals. And so devaluation of morph prices is just a fact of life with breeding morph boas. And, and a lot of the boa breeders are constantly chasing the next big gene. You know, they want to be that one guy at the top of the pyramid to drop 15 grand on a boa and then produce the babies and sell them. But it, it just seems like this, you know, constant treadmill. You just got to breed more and more new genes. Um, in addition, I, the most that I'll pay for a morph boa is in the $1,000 range. You know, I think a lot of people are not comfortable with paying more than that for a boa. I mean, after all, it is just a pet. So, um... A lot of what affects the boa morph is a lot more pronounced in ball pythons. And, you know, ball pythons are effectively, they only have morph animals. And I've heard stories about some of these ball python genes, which start out selling for like 30 grand, and then they're down to $300 just a few, you know, five or six years later, you know, which is kind of a very depressing situation. Um, and what was really, really tragic is that you get a lot of normals or wild types or whatever you want to call them, ball pythons, that are produced as a byproduct of the morph breeding. I've seen at many snake shows, I've seen these ball pythons, normal ball pythons, that are selling for as little as $5 a piece. In fact, I had a guy that bought one of my red tails who told me that he buys the $5 ball pythons in order to feed them to his pet king cobra. And, you know, that to me, that's just extremely tragic situation. I remember as a kid, um, back in the 80s, ball pythons were relatively rare where I lived. And, you know, if you even saw a normal ball python, it would cost at least $100, you know, in the 80s money, which is much more valuable today, of course. Um, and just to see these animals devalued so much by the whole morph industry, when I know, you know, people have what they'll say what they want about ball pythons, but they are cool animals and they certainly are more, worth more than, you know, $5 to feed to your pet king cobra. The second disadvantage with working with morph boas is that not all morphs are created equal. So some of the morphs are definitely beautiful and spectacular, um, like this VPI T positive albino. But I've seen pictures of these other animals that are supposedly morphs, and I look at them and I don't even know what it is. You know, to me it just looks like a normal wild type garden variety common boa constrictor. So um, just because there's a minor difference in the pattern that may or may not be genetically inheritable, that doesn't make it a morph. If no, also, even if it is genetic and you can pass it on, 
if it's not something cool to look at and spectacular, no one is going to want it. And, you know, why should it be worth all this money? I've seen some of these new, you know, morphs that people claim that are trying to get like $10,000 a piece for. And I've heard stories about people investing in these kinds of projects blindly. And they end up a few years later with some babies and the babies really aren't worth much of anything because no one will buy them because it's not a spectacular animal to look at. So again, not all morphs are the same. Make sure you pick your morphs carefully when you decide which ones that you want to work with. Another big disadvantage to working with morph boas is that certain morphs can have genetic diseases that are associated with them. So the way that morphs are often established is that breeders will cross together two closely related animals through a process called line breeding, which is a form of inbreeding. And if there's a recessive gene that creates the morph, it might become apparent in the next generation. Um, the responsible thing to do would then be to breed the animal with the recessive mutation to an unrelated genetic stock, so to back cross to unrelated stock, in order to diversify the gene pool. Um, if you don't do this, you can have issues due to inbreeding depression. And I covered inbreeding in a recent video, so if you're interested, please check out that video. Um, if you, there's the presence of certain genetic malformations in animals, which might be related to inbreeding, that has been done. For example, in call albinos, often there will be animals that crop up that are either missing one eye or they're missing both eyes. And this is thought to be due to the inbreeding. Um, breeding back to unrelated genetic stock would diversify the gene pool and the animals don't have this problem. For example, I have a call albino that's been outcrossed and it doesn't have any of these associated issues due to inbreeding depression. The effects of inbreeding can also be amplified by breeding animals that are too young. And so sometimes people will power feed an animal to get it up to breeding size at a younger age and then breed it when it's too young in order to try to make their money back, um, which is another issue with the way that certain people are breeding morph animals. When we think about morphs, what we're talking about are fundamentally genetic mistakes. So it's an error in the sequence of the DNA that leads to a change in the phenotype, such as a different color or a different pattern. And so morph animals would not survive in the wild, the majority of them. For example, the albinos, if they were out in the wild, they would stick out like a sore thumb and a predator would pick them off pretty quickly. Um, in addition, the albinos have poor eyesight and they have reduced protection from ultraviolet rays. So these animals can only survive in a protected captive environment. However, when you change one gene, often you get more than one effect because genes typically have multiple effects. So if you have a mutation in a gene that causes a change in the color of the animal, it might also cause some kind of biochemical change that we can't even see. And you know we might not even know about it until there's some um, deleterious effect on the animals. Along these lines, there are a number of different examples of morphs and boa constrictors, which have negative health effects. And people are advised not to breed these specific boa constrictors, not to produce them. The most famous is called the super motley boa constrictor. The motley gene is an incomplete dominant gene. If an animal just has one copy, it's got this circular pattern down its back. But when you have two copies of the incomplete dominant uh, motley gene, the super motley form, this causes an all black boa constrictor, which typically dies within the first year or two of life. They don't do well at all. They don't grow and they typically die pretty quickly. In fact, I don't know if anyone's ever gotten one past you know, about a year or two of age. The super jungle is another example of an unhealthy combination. Um, some people report that their super jungles have made it to adulthood, but a lot of breeders have reported that the super jungles die within a year or two of age. And then um, super marin is another unknown 
You know, I've heard that these animals are sterile. You know, and Marin is one of my favorite genes that I'm working with, so I'm especially um, interested in if that's true. And then there's a really cool looking morph called the Scoria, which unfortunately is said to have neurological issues. They have these head wobbles, um, not unlike the spider gene in ball pythons. So unfortunately, when you get that cool pattern or color due to a morph gene, you might also be getting these unwanted health effects that go with that particular gene. The last disadvantage I want to mention about breeding morph boas is sometimes the genetics can be extremely confusing. And that's especially when you're talking about having multiple genes in the same animal. So sometimes you can't even really see the contribution of that gene, and you don't really know for sure that the animal carries the gene. This is uh, often a problem with many jungle boas. Um, the jungle gene has a very variable phenotype. There's a number of characteristics that the jungle animals may or may not have. And often animals that aren't jungles have some of the same characteristics. In addition, there might be an animal that has a barely visible jungle characteristic and it's labeled as a low expression jungle or a possible jungle. So it just gets very confusing and you can't really be sure that you even have the animal that it says it is. In addition, a number of times you'll get an animal that has a 50% or a 66% possibility of being heterozygous. For example, this animal has a 50% possibility of being het for the call albino based on its ancestry. This is a jungle marin boa. But unfortunately, the only way to tell will be to cross it to a call albino boa and see what the babies come out as. Um, hopefully, there will be some genetic testing for uh, heterozygotes at some point in the future, and it'll be a lot easier and quicker. But right now, you have to do the test cross in order to tell. So it can be very confusing sometimes if you don't know what boa you have. Um, in addition, you might buy a boa that is supposedly 100% hat for a gene, and you grow it up, and you do your breeding, you know, four or five years later, and it turns out it wasn't hat at all. You know, the person either lied or they got had a mistake in poor record keeping, and you just wasted all the time growing up the animal. And then you might get a boa that has um, hats that you don't even know about, and the breeder might not even know about it. A lot of animals that you buy might be het for call or het for anry or something. And the only way to tell would be to do the test crosses of all these genes to be sure. And you might not want animals being het for all these genes because there could be negative health consequences, as I mentioned um, in the previous topic. And then a final issue that you might have to keep track of is the ancestry of the boa. So you might have Colombian morphs, you might have Central American morphs, you might even have some boa constrictor constrictor, true red tail in your morphs. And you really should keep track of the ancestry. For example, you might have a boa constrictor morph that's 25% true red tail boa, and you breed that to an animal that's 25% uh, Central American boa, and then the offspring turns out to be 12.5% Central American, 12.5% uh, true red tail, etc. And it just gets really confusing. And so I, I've noticed that for reticulated pythons, they have these super dwarf and dwarf morphs, and they got to keep track of the contribution of each. So the record keeping gets very tedious with, in some cases, with morph boas. And there is a huge chance that there might be some kind of mistake. Those are a few things to think about when you're planning your uh, morph breeding activities. As always, I welcome any questions or comments that you might have. You can leave them below. Also, you can feel free to reach out to me if I can be of any assistance. I thank you for watching and enjoy your boas.